All right. I believe I'm live now. I will get used to this live, um, this live system. Anyway, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to the lecture. Um, after the lecture that I gave on number series, a number of you DM'd me asking me to cover some other topics that you are studying for the OutSchool Africa exam. So I took all those requests in and I picked the most commonly requested topics and this was one of them. So I decided to um, do a lecture on this. Um, now, before I start, um, if it's okay with you, um, I want to, I'm not sure how many people are on. If you can please comment in the YouTube comment box, I'm using a new, um, I'm trying out a new live streaming software and I want to see if I can see your comments as you comment them. So if you can please just leave, okay, I'm seeing a reaction, a thumbs up. Okay. That's nice. Um, can somebody write a comment? I just want to see if it comes through on my side so that if you're asking questions, I can see your questions. I'm waiting for some comments. Is it possible? Let me see if I can write a comment and you'll see it. Okay, so I've seen, I've seen my own comment, but I'm not seeing, aha, thank you so much. Omoruyi, Omoruyi, thank you so much for commenting. I just want to make sure that the comments come through. Okay, wonderful. You see it. Thank you. Thank you. I just want, because it's, this is my first time using this software. So I want to make sure that if anybody comments, I can see it. Okay. So let me cover, let me just summarize what we are going to be talking about. Okay. Um, we are going to go through, you know, you have that link in your study guide. Um, and we're going to go through all the concepts. I think it's like 40 of them. Now I went through this yesterday and there are some that even I don't understand. Okay. So I think the first thing I want to say is, you know, I know that all of you are, are very excited about this opportunity and I'm excited for you. Okay. And the first obstacle, so to speak, is the exam. Okay. So I want to encourage you that you don't have to know everything, you know, because the exam didn't say you have to score hundred percent to be admitted. Okay. There's a cutoff mark. I'm not even sure what the cutoff mark is, but there's a cutoff mark. Okay. So while you want to do your best, you also don't want to kill yourself. All right. So even as you're studying, you begin to see, okay, the areas that you are doing better in naturally and the areas that maybe you're struggling a little bit, please don't make yourself sick trying to be perfect in all the areas. Okay. Um, it's about getting over the past mark, not about being perfect. All right. So I want to say that because sometimes you read these concepts and it's like, if you don't understand even one of it is like, Oh, if I don't understand it, you know, it's going to affect me negatively. You know, the exam is covering many areas. It's covering mathematics. It's covering, you know, these, uh, computer science is covering your specific track, you know, questions, back end, front end, whatever track you chose. So just do your best, you know, the, the, the areas that come a little bit easier to you really focus on those areas so that in those areas, you know, you score hundred percent so that even in, in the areas that maybe you are not going to score that much, it's not because you scored hundred percent in the other areas, it's not going to affect you so much. Okay. So that's just a little bit of wisdom before we start. Um, and then, like I said, some of these, even I myself found a little difficult to understand. So I'm not going to pretend to know what I don't know. If I don't know something, I will just tell you, I don't know. Okay. But we'll definitely talk about what the, you know, the concepts that I think I understand a little bit better. And I will try to explain it to you in ways that hopefully it will help you to understand as well. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So now you should be looking at my screen and my head should be in the lower right corner. All right. Okay. Now 
I will be looking at the comments as we go along. So if you have any question, don't wait for me to ask. If you have any question, just type it in the comment and I will read it and I will answer. All right. Okay. So let's start. So the first uh, concept is big O notation. All right. Now, when we think about computers, computers are all around us. We have our phone, we have our iPad, our laptops, our smart TV, you know, those, those TVs that now you can watch YouTube on it. Those are all computers. Okay. Those are all computing devices. Okay. Now, uh, computing, uh, com computing devices use resources. Okay. So you have memory, you have storage. Storage is where that is. If you, let's say you download a video on your phone, it goes in the storage. Okay. Then you have the memory, which is, um, like a temporary storage. It just allows the compute, the, the computing device to load something faster. Okay. So when it goes into temporary storage, the random access memory, it just allows you to retrieve it faster. That's one of the main reasons for RAM. Okay. You have your, your computing, that is your, your, the brain of the, of the device, the CPU. So these are resources that are necessary for the computations that are happening. You send a text, you watch a video, you record a voice note. These are all computations that require resources. Okay. Now, whenever you require resources, you have to think of efficiency so that you are not burning through, you know, your resources. Like for example, let's think of battery. Okay. We can all understand battery. Okay. The more you are doing on your phone, the faster your battery drains, the less you are doing or the less computations are happening on your phone, the more your battery remains. So that is a perfect example of resource usage. Okay. These computations are not happening in a vacuum. They are using resources. Okay. So now when we speak of big O notation, big O notation is a way to, um, is a way to communicate how resource intensive this computation is. That's all. Okay. Big O is just saying, okay, how much uh, either time. So big O, there are two main dimensions. You have time and you have space. Space has to do with actual resources. Okay. Like memory and things like that. And time is how long it takes to complete. Okay. So big O is just talking about, you know, given this computation, this function, this uh, algorithm, this computation, how long relatively is it going to take to complete? So it's just talking about the efficiency. How efficient is this algorithm? That's really all it is. Okay. On a high level, that's big O notation. Okay. Let me, I don't know why. Just hold on a second. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm going to move these comments to my other screen. Um, you can see this, but I can. So that, you know, because it's, it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't showing uh -huh. in case anybody's asking questions. Okay. Let's continue. So now when we get now to, you know, how do we, so what is the big O notation for a particular algorithm? Okay. So that's what this section is talking about that you have, um, you know, constant time, which is O of one, you know, O one means constant time. So what that means is that no matter how, um, how will I say, no matter how big the data that that algorithm is handling, no matter how small or no matter how large it is, it's going to take the same time. That's what we call constant time. So I read the example that they gave here that if you, if you put, let's say you are shopping online and you put 10 items into your shopping cart, clicking the payment button is going to take the same time to pay for those 10 as it would take to pay for, let's say a thousand. Okay. You put a thousand things and it computes the total price and you press pay. Whether it's one item or whether it's a thousand items, the time it takes to make the payment does not change. So you can say that that algorithm that is, you know, in charge of the payment action, that algorithm is constant time, big O of one. Okay. Big O one. Okay. Then you now have big O N. That N connotes number or size, okay? Size of the input. 
So the example they gave here was downloading videos online. If you, if you line up one video to download, that's going to take less time than if you line up 10 videos. So now the algorithm in charge of downloading is, you know, the big O is going to be O of N. Why? Because depending on the number of videos you have lined up to download, that's going to affect the time it will take to complete the download, you know, action. All right. So that is really, truly what big O is about. Okay. And I don't want to go beyond, you know, there's, if you, if you, if you, you know, if you Google online, you will see that there are other, um, how will I say other big O representations, but I don't want to introduce it here because it's really about what they have told you to study. Okay. Now the last point I will make on big O is like they wrote here. It says it always represents the worst case scenario. Okay. So let me, hmm, let me give an example of that. Let's go back to the video downloading. Okay. Uh, let's say, um, it's, it's like a video downloading service. Okay. You select the video and it will download it for you to your device. So somebody could say, okay, um, uh, Dio, um, only loaded one video and it downloaded in three seconds. So why can't we say, um, you know, so if there, if there are many people like Dio who, you know, they are only loading one video, why can't we say it's constant time, right? Aha. Uh -huh. Somebody could say, what if majority of people who use this service only, um, you know, only queue one video to download? Why can't we say it's constant time since it's only one video? Okay. Big O always thinks of the worst case scenario. So what is the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is that somebody will come to that service and load every single video there is online. If there's a video online, they will load it for download. That's the worst case scenario. Uh -huh. So your big O has to always account for the worst case scenario. You cannot account for best case because what if best case will not happen? So the benefit of accounting for worst case is that it will never be worse than that. Okay. So your big O, you know, notation will never be worse than the worst case scenario. So that means it will either, it will, it, it will either be as bad as that or better. All right. So it's important when you're thinking about, okay, what is the likely, what, what is the efficiency of this algorithm or what is the resource, um, that is a, what is the resource burden of this function or this algorithm? You always think worst case scenario so that hopefully it will never be that worse. It will actually be better. Okay. And so your resource allocation will end up being enough because you have accounted for worst case scenario. Okay. So that's why big O always represents worst case scenario. Okay. All right. Let me stop there. Anybody have any question about that before I move on? While I drink my seven up. Okay. Any question? Okay. Well, if you have just ask, okay. All right. So, um, the next thing here is sorting algorithm. Now, this was a very good video. Okay. So I'm not going to cover it. Why? Because I don't think I can say it better than this video. This video to me was really good. Just six minutes and it covered 15 sorting algorithms. Okay. The whole point of sorting algorithm is that you know, throughout, I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You're, you know, listing, you go to Facebook and you want to list comments in order of most recent, or you want to list it in order of uh, most emoji. Uh -huh. That is all sorting. Okay. So you can't escape sorting. All right. So sorting is very important in, uh, in, in comp that is computer science and also in software development. Okay. So I'm not going to go into it because I think that video was really good. If you still have a specific question on one of the sorting algorithm, you can always ask me in the Slack. Okay. All right. Uh, recursion. Recursion is a concept that is important in software development because again, you know, you find yourself sometimes doing something over and over again. 
All right. And so recursion in software development is a way to make an algorithm repeat itself as many times as needed until you meet an exit condition. What that means is until you meet a condition that the algorithm no longer needs to run. Okay. All right. Um, Confor, if your network is bad, I think you can adjust the, on Facebook, you can adjust it down, I think to even 360p. I think if you click the gear and you can adjust it to 360, hopefully that will help. Okay. All right. So that's the whole thing with recursion. I like the example they gave in the website is that, you know, um, you know, they are asking you what role are you sitting in the movie theater? You, you know, you ask the person, you know, in front of you and then you add one, you know, so it says if the person in front of you did the same thing. So for example, let's say you have a row of 10, okay, 10 rows. And let's just say that you are in row number nine, but you don't know the row number. Okay. So in your mind, you're thinking, okay, if the person in front of me knows their row number and tells me, then all I have to do is add one to what they tell me. And then I will know my own. Okay. So that's what you, you are thinking individually. Okay. Now imagine that after you ask the person in front of you, they also don't know their row number. So they have the same thoughts you did. And they say, Oh, if I ask the person in front of me and they know, then they can tell me. Okay. So that's recursion. Recursion is what allows a function or an algorithm to call itself, to repeat itself over and over acting on a new piece of data. Okay. So that person in front will now ask that person in front of them who will now ask the person in front of them. Guess what? If they get, if the, if the person in the second row asks the person in the first row, that first row person has to give an answer. Okay. Or else the recursion, you know, could go on what forever. Okay. It will break. So that's what I mean by exit condition. Recursion works when there is you get to a point where you no longer need to call the algorithm. So in that movie theater example, if everybody keeps asking who is in front of them, eventually they, they will now ask the first row person. That person in first row has to know their row number. So if that person in first row now says row number one, then the person behind will now know, okay, I'm row number two. Then they will report it to the person behind row number three. Then they will report it until they now report it back to you who first asked. And then the function ends. Okay. Because an exit condition was met. All right. So that's really the idea of recursion. When you, when you think recursion is just repeating a function, being able to repeat itself. Okay. Not another function. Okay. It's being able to repeat the function or the algorithm being able to repeat itself. Okay. I could code this live for you, but because we have so many concepts to get through, I'm not going to do it now. If you want that, if you want me to code a recursion function for you, let me know in the Slack and I will probably, it won't be live. I'll just do it and record it and I'll post it in Slack. Okay. So you can see it in action. Maybe that will also help, but that's the idea of recursion. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Big data. I don't know much about big data. Big data is just about, you know, the, the reason why big data has become so important is because look at the world population. We are 7 billion plus. And look at all their computing devices. I mean, there's just so much data, okay? And so our traditional methods of data analysis and data management have not been able to keep up, okay, with the, with the load, the data load that the world is now generating. That's big data, okay? So big data, like they wrote here, they said, it's data that is so large and complex, it's impossible to manage with conventional. That conventional is maybe what we were doing 50 years ago, okay, or 40 years ago. Uh -huh. But presently, we have so much data being generated that we now have big data tools and big data, um, you know, career field. Uh -huh. Right. So that's really what it is. I think the key thing there is just to recognize that big data just is dealing with data that is so large, it's so complex. Okay. All right. 
Now, data structures. You know, people have been asking me a lot of questions in the DM about data structures. Let me just, you see this list here? Even I, like for example, tree, graph, linked list, heap. I couldn't tell. I don't have, not, 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 that, not that I've not used it in my job, but I've not used it in my job. Okay. So I'm going to give you a trick. All right. I think out of this list, you just need to focus on array, stack, queue, hash table, and linked list. Okay. Array, stack, queue, hash table, and linked list. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, you know, those ones that I just mentioned. All right. I'm not going to go into the others simply because I don't know them enough to teach them well. Okay. Now I'm not going to code it. I'm just going to explain what they are because you don't need, at this point, you should not be learning to code. Okay. That's why you are entering the school is for them to teach you to code. Uh -huh. So don't bother yourself with coding. All right. Now array, what is an array? Ar an array is just, an. at this point, I'm going to use my, uh, just hold on. Okay. I'm going to use my sketch pad. Okay. I'm sketching on my iPad. You see it on my laptop. So an array is just a, a like, it's, it's like a group of numbers, but they are in order, not in order. Sorry. They are a sequence. Okay. So let me, in most coding languages, an array is, let me show you how it is. Let me, sorry. I'm just trying to think how can I, you know, do it the best way. So let's, let's, let me do it in JavaScript. Okay. So const array is equal to an array. Usually in code, it's a square bracket around it. And it's just a group, a sequence group of anything. It could be an array of numbers. Okay. So let me call this num array. Okay. It could be an array of words. So word array. Okay. The key thing is just those square brackets and the fact that it's a sequence. It doesn't even have to be in order. Okay. It doesn't have to be sorted. It's just a list almost. And that, that's the best way I can describe it. So you can have apple and then you can have bat and then you can have cat and then you can have dog. Okay. So that is an array of words. Okay. And you can have you know, depending on the data type, you can have an array of really any data type. That's the truth. Okay. Um, and that's what an array is. The, the, um, the, uh, how will I say the, the, um, one of the most important characteristic of array is you are able to use the in an index number to identify, you know, which item is at a position in the array. So let me explain. You know, the first entry in an array is known as index zero because in computer science, we count from zero, not one. So it's known as index zero. Okay. So what, what item in the num array, what item is at index zero? The answer is one. Okay. So I can show you that. So if I were to, don't worry what I'm doing, just follow along. If I console log num array. And I indicate in square zero. Okay. So the num array is referring to the array in question. Then that zero in the square is talking about what is at index zero. Okay. So if I run this code, I get one, you see. Okay. I get one. Okay. Because that is what is at index zero. So if I say this again, if I say, okay, what is at index four? Okay. And I run that code. Let me clear. And I run it. I get five because index four is let's count it. Zero, one, two, three, four. So index four contains number five in the norm array. If I change it to word array, 
And let's say I say what is at index two in the word array, I'm going to get cat. Because if we count it, zero, one, two. Okay. So that's it. Oh, that's array. <laughs> okay. It is a data structure. All right. Let's go back to computer science. You see data structure An array is one of many data structures in computer science. And I just wanted to, you know, explain to you in a, at least I hope it's a simple way what array is. Okay. And the key thing about array is when you have an array, you are able to query the element at a particular index by number, by the index number, index zero, index one. What happens if you put an index number that is not there? Like for example, if I put, um, yes, Tunde, the video is recording. Yes, you can watch it later. So in the word array, if I put index, if I put index five, okay, and I run it, it tells me undefined. Why? Because there's no index five. There's zero, there's one, there's two, there's three. Three is the last one. There's no index five. So it comes back undefined. Okay. So that's array. All right. Okay. Let's look at stack. Okay. And for stack, I'm going to draw a, a stack in computer science is, is a data structure where when you put an element in a stack, it is element in, sorry, my computer was not charging. Okay. It's first in. Like, okay, so a stack data structure is, is a way of arranging information, okay? Now, what makes it a stack is the order in which you can put something in and the order in which you can take something out, okay? I'm going to talk about stack and then I'll talk about queue because they are actually related, okay? So this is stack, okay? So stack, ahead. So in a stack data structure, Let's say I put in, let's say we are, uh, let's say uh, we are putting balls into a stack. Okay. So I put a red ball. Okay. And then I put in a blue ball after it. Then I put in a green ball. Okay. Then a purple ball and then an orange ball. Okay. Simple group of items in a stack. You can only take items out if it was the last one in. Okay. So for example, I just put red, blue, green, purple, orange. I can't take green out before taking a uh, orange and purple. Okay. So if I wanted to take any ball out, the first ball I can take out is purple. Is 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 um is um ah, where is the eraser? Uh-huh is orange. Orange has to go first in a stack. So if orange is out, uh -huh, then I have to take out purple before I get to green. That's a stack. Okay. That's simple as I can explain it to you. Okay. Let's talk about Q. Okay. Because I told you array stack Q. Let's talk about Q because it's related. It's not the same, but it's related. In a Q, it is First in, first out. Okay. For stack, it is last in, last out. Okay. For a queue, it is first in, first out. So I will, I will describe. Let's say I put in the red ball. Then I put in blue. Then I put in green, purple, and orange. Okay. In a queue is first in first out. So if I want to get the green ball out, I can't just go and lift it. I have to first take out red and then take out blue before I take out green. Okay. That's it. I'm not going to say more than that. Okay. So that is the stack data structure and the queue data structure with a stack. Think of it as a stack of plates. You know, when you stack a plate, when you stack plates on each other, you can't take the bottom plate out without risking breaking all the other plates on top. 
So you have to, the last plate you put has to be, oh, sorry, did I say Lilo? I lied. Last in, first out. Sorry. Aha. Uh -huh. So the last plate you put has to be the first one you take out in a stack. Okay. Whereas in a queue, like a queue, a line, you are queuing for the ATM. Is the first person in that is the first person after they use the ATM, they come out. Anybody jumping the queue, they get beaten up. Okay. All right. So that is stack and queue. Any questions there? I know I've been talking a lot. Let me stop and ask. Does anybody have any question before I continue? Okay. 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 Well, you can be asking. Okay. All right. So we are still on data structure. Okay. Hash table. Mm. Okay. I can explain a little bit. I'm not going to go deep. So we have done array. We have done stack. We have done queue. Let's look at hash table. A hash table is, is a way of organizing data with key value pairs, they come in pairs. So let me explain that. I think the best way I can do it is code. So let's create a hash table of, um, let's call it students, okay? Yes, Ikem, yes, I was, I, yes, I corrected myself. Yes, it's last in, uh, first out, thank you. Okay, okay, wonderful, okay, good. Ugochi. Okay, good. All right, let's continue. So let me create a hash table of called students. Okay. Now with hash, you see as in array, it was square in hash. It is the curly bracket. Okay. So now with hash, we have what we call key value pairs. So let's say, um, mm, mm, okay. Let's say these are students that have different roles. Okay, so let's say we have uh, we have um, head. Uh, no, this is wrong. Let's say we have head head. How is it in JavaScript now? Head boy. Okay, and head boy is um, Olumide. Okay. And then we have head girl and head girl is a mem. Okay. Now let's say we have, um, um, hall prefect. Okay. And the hall prefect is, um, Chikodi. Okay. And let's have one more. Let's have a sanit sanitation prefect, okay? And um, let's say it's Dauda, okay? All right? So this is a hash table called students, okay? And it is made up of key value pair. This is a key value pair, okay? This is the key and this is the value of that key, all right? key value pair. So let's assume now I wanted to query this hash table for the head girl. Okay. So to query it for the head girl, I will say students. And then there's a couple of ways to do it. You can use a, a bracket. I can say students and then I will say head girl. Okay. And if I run that, Head girl is not defined. Okay. It's not an array. Sorry. Aha. Uh -huh. Sorry. I used the wrong notation. I used array notation instead of a hash table. So with hash table, you say the name of, don't memorize this. I'm just explaining. Please, this is code. I don't, please don't make your work harder. Don't memorize this. This is, I'm just giving you an example of what is hash table, okay? So that if somebody says, what is key value, at least you will say, ah, okay, Arit said key value. But please don't try to say, okay, you want to code this. This is what you're entering the school to learn, okay? All right. So please don't make your work harder. So 
you know, this is the student hash. And then I'm now looking for the value of this key. I'm looking for the value of the head girl key. Okay. So this is how I query it and I ran it and it gave me a mem. Okay. If I now take hall prefect and I'm looking for the value of hall prefect key in the students hash table. Okay. I'm looking for the value of the hall prefect key in the students hash table. Okay. And if I run that, I get Chikodi. Okay. So that is hash table. Good. Now, finally, <laughs> I'm looking at the, oh, Naimeka, sorry, my dear. You see, let me tell you what happened. Um, I had posted the list of lectures I planned for this week, but it got deleted somehow. So I lost that schedule. Okay. So I now decided, okay, I will just post whoever can make it, but I'm recording it. Okay. So nobody's going to miss out. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So coming now to linked list. All right. Now I'm going to go back to my sketch because I think <clears throat> it's easier to understand as a sketch. So a linked list is a data structure where every element in the list has a value and has a pointer. Okay. So like it has a value and it has a position as well in the list. So like an array, because array has the element and it has an index position. Okay. Index zero, index one with a linked list is a, is a, is a list as well, but the elements have a position, but they also have a pointer. So what does that look like? So let me write here linked list. I'm not going to go deep. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm going to explain what I think will help you understand at least on a high level. Okay. So a linked list is a list of elements. All right. So this is, you know, this is one element and this is a second element. And this is a third element. And this is a fourth element. Okay. And they are all in a list. So the linked list is, is, you know, they are all, let me do like this. Okay. They are all in the linked list. Okay. All right. Now, each of these elements has a value, a position, like this is position. This is first position. Okay. It has a position. It has a value. Let's give it value four. Okay. But it could be anything. Okay. It could be anything, but we're just, we're using integer. Okay. Numbers. And it also has a pointer. Okay. So that's the first element. Let's say the second element has value seven and it has a pointer. Okay. And then the third, let's say it has value eight and it has a pointer. Okay. And it doesn't have to have a pointer. I've forgotten what they call it in linked list, but let's say this is now the fourth element and it doesn't have, it's not pointing to anything. Okay. That's a linked list. Okay. That's a linked list. So instead of it just being an element that has a position, it also has what is called a node that points from, that is pointing to something or it's pointed at from another, you know, element. Okay. So that's what we call a linked list. I'm not going to go deeper than that. Okay. If you can just remember this picture, you are good. Okay. If you can just, if you can just remember this picture. You are good. Okay. As long as you can remember it has its, it has its value and it also has a pointer that is pointing to another element in the list. That's it. That's all you need to know. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to keep going because time is, you know, time is, <laughs> I thought I was going to get through all of this, but apparently not. Okay. I'll, I'll do another one. Okay. Um, if you have your questions, just be asking. Okay. All right. Now, greedy algorithm, hill climbing. I'm not going to spend too much time in this. I think just pick, let me show you the sentence that you just keep in your mind here. Okay. 
A greedy algorithm picks the best immediate choice and never reconsiders its choices. Oh, ton shikina. I mean, you can read if you like. I, I encourage you to, but I think that sentence there, just know it, okay? The hill climbing, this is more of, um, this is more of, uh, you know, because you have greedy algorithm. So this is now hill climbing algorithm. What is the sentence? So here, the hill climbing algorithm attempts to find a better solution by generating a neighboring solution. So let me explain. Greedy algorithm is like, once, once it lands on a way forward, it doesn't care what the alternatives are. I'm just going to take this one has, it's like, it's like, I don't know how to say it. It's like the first one that worked. Okay. This is the first algorithm that, that, that is, this is the first approach that worked. Mm? I don't care about any other one. I'm just going to take it. Okay. Um, that is good. If by chance it happens to land on the real best. But it's not good if there were better alternatives, but it didn't consider because it's greedy. Okay. With the hill climbing, the hill climbing is more like, okay, I have an approach in front of me now, but let me generate another, let me make another attempt to see if this second one ends up being better than the first one. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Again. I don't think you need to spend a lot of time on this. That's just my personal opinion. Just read it and just try to understand at least based on what you've read, okay? They're not going to ask you to write algorithm. I don't really think they are going to give you an example of algorithm and to ask you which one is greedy, which one no, because this is deep computer science, okay? All right, okay. Same thing, <laughs> simulated annealing, same thing. Um, I think you just need to read it. Okay, so all this uh, algorithm approach, greedy, hill climbing, simulated, just read it, okay? But don't kill yourself, okay? All right. Now, dynamic programming. Um, dynamic programming, the whole idea of dynamic programming is the using of former computations to help solve present computation. That's it. It's dynamic, okay? Dynamic means moving, okay? Uh -huh, changing. Um, and so that's really what it's about. They gave an example there. You know, it was nice. He was able to calculate, you know, one plus one plus one to eight. And then when the father added plus one, he didn't go back and do one plus one plus one plus all the way to eight. No, or to, or to nine. He just added one to the eight that he had already computed before. That's it. I think it's a wonderful example. That's dynamic programming. It's using the results of what was computed prior to compute the present problem. Okay? That's it. Okay. Um, machine learning. Machine learning, I can summarize just in a nutshell. Machine learning is the process of empowering a computer to, how will I say it? It's, it's weird because like, can you teach a computer to learn? But that's essentially what it is, is empowering a computer to almost remember what it had, how it had handled a problem in the past, you know, to remember it and then to recognize if the present problem can be solved the same way. That's the best way I can simplify machine learning for you. Okay. It's a way of, you know, a way of coding, a way of, a uh, you know, computation that makes a, makes a computer, a machine, you know, an application makes it able to remember in quotes, how something was handled so that instead of you coding, coding it again to solve that problem again, it will pull from what it remembered and it will apply in the present scenario. Okay. But, you know, click the link and read, you know, read what they wrote there. But that's how I can summarize it, okay, for you, okay. Now, this P versus NP problem, I'll be very honest with you. I didn't really understand it, but if, if I were in your shoes preparing for exam, hmm, I would just focus on, you see this 
question here, they said 7 times 17 equals P. It's easy to find P. Okay? But the flip side is they don't give you the factors that they are multiplying, but they give you, you know, the... The uh, that, that 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 is the, they give you the solution, okay, and they put a stipulation here that you cannot make one to be number one and the other to be one nineteen because they, that's you know one times one nineteen. Hey, that's easy. So what the P versus NP problem is just saying is that there is a lack of an efficient computer algorithm that can find these two values efficiently. That's it, okay. Because for you to find it, like if we're to do it with hand now, we will have to start with number two and work our way up. Uh -huh. So what they are saying here is that, you know, there isn't an efficient algorithm to do this. Now, this 119 is a small number. So even we as human beings, we can do it. But if I gave you a huge number, like in the millions or like the hundreds of million number, and asked you to find the two factors. I mean, you, you might just slap me, okay? So this is, that's what, aha, uh -huh, thank you, compute, wonderful. Ugochi, just put it in the chat, okay? I think if you just read through this, this is, this is real computer science. That's the science part of it, okay? This is not really coding, in my opinion, okay? This is the science of computer science, okay? I didn't spend too much time on it. Um, like I said in the beginning, to me, a good strategy is be good at what you can really be good at so that the part of the exam that you're not so good at, it won't, it won't drag you down too much, okay? Because you can't kill yourself. Okay, now, how do computers work? I think this was a very good, um, this is a very good graphic, okay? It's a very good graphic. Let me talk about this word abstraction. Abstraction just means taking the basic computations and almost hiding it from the end user, okay? So I like how they put it here. They said car analogy. You can drive without having to understand how the car works. You don't have to be a car mechanic to know how to drive a car. That's abstraction. Okay, the, 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 the manufacturer of the car has abstracted all the functionality that makes a car work. They have abstracted it under the hood, into the engine, into the transmission. They've abstracted it away. So you don't have to know how the transmission is turning, how the gas is, you know, generating energy, how the engine. No, you don't have to know any of that. All you have to do is enter the car, to, uh, you know, ig ignition key put it in gear and you drive, okay? So when you have high abstraction, that's what that means is, you know, the car is already assembled, you just use it, okay? You just drive it. Whereas low abstraction means, no, all that has all been assembled. Maybe now everything is in its separate parts. So now you need that knowledge. Now you need that ability to know how things fit and to know how things work. That's low abstraction. Okay, and I really like how they, you know, describe it here. I think this picture is, is, is good. Okay, all right, so let's continue. Okay, now I'll be, I'll be very honest with you. This halting problem, I didn't watch the video because I had to go through this whole thing yesterday before, <laughs> before this lecture. I didn't watch the video. Um... Again, this is a science, you know, very heavy science in computer science. Um, I think just watch the video. Try to understand what you can. Don't kill yourself, okay? If you don't understand this video, don't say, ah, I'm done. No, you are not done, okay? Thankfully, the exam is testing a lot of things, okay? All right. Um, concurrency. Now, you know, this is a, 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 a long, you can see the, the, the section is long. You know, it's talking about parallelism, risk, on okay, concurrency. <clears throat> concurrency in software development is important because you are running different computations, okay? You're running different functions depending on how large your application is or depending on how many users you have. For example, e-commerce, okay? You go to an e-commerce website. 
I don't know what is popular in Nigeria. You go to a website where you can purchase things and you have so many users. So guess what? They are adding items to the cart. So many users are doing it at the same time. Um, they are checking out. So many users are checking out at the same time. You are, you know, completing your purchase. You, you put your credit card, you click the button. So many users are doing it at the same time. So concurrency is a property, okay, of programs, application system that allow tasks to run almost like overlapping time, okay? Can you imagine if you went to the e-commerce website and they queue you up? You know, you want to check out. They will say, okay, you are, you are number 125, right? <laughs> so what that is saying is that we cannot handle more than one person checking out at the same time. So we are going to queue you up. Nobody will use that website. Nobody who wants to wait in line online to, to wait to check out. Okay. So this concurrency allows, it's, it's like that property that allows things to happen in overlapping time. Okay. All right. So we now have this parallel, you know, so now we are going now into the sub topics under that concurrency. Okay. Subtopics. Okay. So parallelism is just saying two tasks, two or more can run at the same time. The machine has to have multi-processing capability. Okay. So that means, you know, whatever machine, whatever the server, you know, the application, it has to have that multi-processing ability. But once it does, parallelism just means two or more tasks can run at the same time. Okay. Now, race condition is now a side effect of parallelism, okay? It's a side effect. And I like the, exa the example that they gave. A race condition is what happens when you have concurrent tasks, okay? They said here banking system. It's not just banking. It happens in so many other things. Okay, so many other parts of software development. Okay, even though they use banking as an example. But a race condition is basically a situation where one task has to finish before another task. But because of parallelism, you are not queuing them. Okay, whenever you are not deliberately queuing tasks, meaning whenever you are not forcing tasks, to happen one after the other, you will always have race condition potential. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Whenever you are not deliberately queuing, forcing tasks to happen one after the other, okay? Or whenever parallelism is occurring in an application, okay? Or you know, a computation, race condition is always a risk, okay? And so they gave an example here. And I think this example is good. If you read it, it's just talking about, you know, you have a particular amount of money, somebody transfers you, you withdraw. Those are two tasks, okay? The transfer and the withdraw, okay? Uh-huh. So it's talking about, when the 500 is added, now you have 1500, but the second transaction, which is, which is the withdrawing, you know, it does not see 1500 because that transaction is in you know, it sees 1000 and it deducts 700 from what it thinks is 1000. Okay. And it does not account for the 500 that was added. So that was a race condition. Okay. There was no explicit control the, the system did not say no matter what transfer must happen first before withdrawal no it didn't say that so because of that there was a race condition okay now from race condition how do we now handle race condition so you see how it's stepping from parallelism which is the task can happen together to race condition which is a potential downside of that togetherness and now the solution to race condition is now mutual exclusion, okay? So in mutual exclusion, it's now saying that when there's an ongoing transaction, 
the system will lock the account involved so that it can finish that transaction before another one starts. Okay? So that's all it's talking about. You see the connection from the parallelism, which is the two tasks able to go at the same time. Now, because of that, there's now a race condition that could happen. Okay? Maybe in your mind, A should finish before B, but a race condition could make it possible that B finish before A and then things could get messed up. So now you have the mutual exclusion, which allows whichever one gets there first, it will lock the system so that that first task, that task that got there first will finish before the second one. Okay. So you don't have an overwriting that ends up, you know, messing up the record, for example. Okay. Okay, let me take a sip of my drink. And any questions for me? It doesn't look like they are. Okay, I'm hoping that this is helpful. That I'm not getting question. I know it doesn't mean that it's not, but I really hope, you know, it's helpful. Okay, now this semaphore, I think is related to this lock, you know, this mutual exclusion. Okay, so I'm not going to go, you know, this semaphore deadlock. It's really just related to how do we resolve race condition through mutual exclusion. That's what it's dealing with, okay? Um, then you have deadlock. It's another problem. Deadlock is it's almost like, you know, now because, you know, one task gets there and then the account is locked, but then another task has also locked the account. <laughs> and so it's almost like they both can't finish and they both can't release the other one to finish. Okay. So it's called a deadlock. Okay. I'm not going to go deep into it. I think if you, if you, I think the key thing here is just to understand the parallelism and the race condition potential, and then the solving of it, the mutual exclusion. Okay. Um, definitely read the semaphore, read the deadlock again. Like I've said before, don't kill yourself. Okay. As long as you have some, some idea, I think is good enough. Okay. Because the exam is not a computer science exam. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, hacking. We are almost at one hour. Okay. Hacking. We, I think we are familiar with what is hacking. Okay. Hacking is just unauthorized access. Okay unauthorized access to a computer system, at least in this case, a computer system. Okay. So this is just, you know, this uh, section. Okay. Hello. If you're still on the live, please bear with me. I'm having network issues. Okay, I think I'm back. That's the thing with live, eh? <laughs> uh, things happen. Okay. Um, all right. I just posted in Slack um, for those who can see. Let me just get to a, a stopping point and then I think, you know, we can continue later. I will do my very best to, you know, be available to you. Okay. So I just wanted to finish um, talking about the computer hacking. So the brute force uh, attack, these are different ways that people hack. Brute force just means you're just trying different things, random things, different things, common passwords. You know, you just keep trying, 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 trying until something works. Brute force is usually done using supercomputers. You know, those who are who have made it their life mission, they usually have supercomputers that are 
you know, using different combinations several times a second. Okay. That's brute force. Um, social engineering is more of, um, you know, just pretending to know somebody, pretending to have a connection with somebody. And the key, the, you know, the key reason is for them to reveal private information that you can now use to hack them. Okay. That's social engineering. Um, security exploit is more of, you know, um, how, you know, um, okay. Like for example, um, you know, this email has a strong password, but this one does not have, okay. Or this social media account has two factor authentication, but this one does not. So it's almost like it's still hacking, but it's trying to find, okay, what's the weakest point at which I can hack this person. Okay. Um, a Trojan horse, this is actually from Greek mythology. A Trojan horse is basically a program that pretends to be something, but it's really something else. Okay. So it's a program that on the surface, it may be, oh, this program will help you take better pictures, but hidden in that program is code that will do something dangerous on your system. Collect, you know, when you're typing, it will track your keystrokes. Um, it will read your, you know, if you open another application, it will read it and send the information somewhere. Um, that's like a Trojan horse kind of hacking. Um, you have rootkit. Um, rootkit is, um, it's like, it's a program that gains what is called root access. So, you know, like, okay, like for windows now, you know how windows, you can have an administrator account, uh -huh, which is more powerful than maybe just a regular account. Okay. Root access is the most powerful user type on any system, any server, any computer. Root access is the most powerful. So a root kit is a program that seeks to gain that root